In this screencast, we will start to get to the heart of radiographic interpretation and define the different patterns that we see. This is part one of a two-part series, and here we will focus on airspace opacities. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to differentiate airspace and interstitial opacities and start to describe the patterns of disease we see on x-ray and CT. One of the keys to understanding the patterns on CT and x-ray is understanding the secondary pulmonary lobule. This is one of the smallest anatomic units that we can readily distinguish on chest CT. It's comprised of a terminal bronchiole with the alveoli, a central pulmonary artery, and then peripheral pulmonary veins and lymphatics. The peripheral portion of the secondary pulmonary lobule is what is commonly involved when there is an interstitial process. And things like increased hydrostatic pressure causing pulmonary edema, lymphatic engorgement, or involvement of the lymphatics by a malignant process or an inflammatory process will, will cause thickening of that interlobular septa. And that's what is often referred to as an interstitial lung process. When we think about the air spaces, we can talk about them with some simple terms that comprise a large range of pathology. So when you see something that you think is involving the airspace, I want you to think, is it linear or wedge-shaped? Is it patchy or multifocal? Is it confluent, meaning it's involving a large contiguous segment of lung tissue? Or is it nodular and well-defined or round and mass-like? When you're looking at things on chest CT, you can be a little bit more specific about what you're seeing. Ground glass is used to describe an intermediate density or incomplete filling or collapse of the alveoli. Consolidation is a dense, complete filling of the alveoli. Atelectasis is collapse of the alveoli. And then when you think about nodules or masses, are they solid? Or we can even have ground glass nodules. Let's talk a little bit more about ground glass. So what is ground glass? It is this intermediate density or incomplete filling of the air spaces. It's not as dense as consolidation, but it's more dense than the normal lung. I've provided you with a graphical representation of the secondary pulmonary lobules, and then I've also given you an example of what ground glass looks like in real life. Ground glass is something you might be familiar with from chemistry class, and it's this obscured glass or slightly textured glass that is not completely transparent, but is instead translucent. If we compare ground glass to consolidation, this is an example of consolidation. Notice how dense the opacification is. So here, instead of incomplete filling or incomplete collapse of the alveoli, we have very dense or near complete filling of the alveoli. Compare that to an example of normal here. Okay, and this is clearly a dense opacification of the lung due to near complete filling. And if I show you ground glass compared to your consolidation, notice the intermediate density of the ground glass and the more dense, complete opacification of the consolidation. Linear opacities are most commonly ascribed to atelectasis. We'll talk more about atelectasis in future lectures, but the atelectasis is often either wedge-shaped or linear, 
and we're commonly going to see it in the lower lobes. Here you can see that this person had this linear opacity that wasn't present one day prior and it was likely some subsegmental atelectasis due to poor inspiration. And this is just showing you the linear nature of that atelectasis on a chest CT. When we think about the D-ALPO framework, this was something that occurred acutely. It occurred rapidly and then resolved. It was lower lobe in a dependent location, and it was linear, and that all leads to the idea that it was atelectasis, okay? The next thing to think about is whether it's ground glass or consolidation or nodules, what sort of pattern does that opacification result in? And one of the patterns can be described as patchy airspace opacities or multifocal airspace opacities. I've given you a graphical representation and then an example of patchy opacities. If we look at this person, we can clearly see the lung is abnormal and it's not confluent in that there are large contiguous areas of abnormality, but there are lots of different places where we can see airspace opacification, and we call this patchy or multifocal. This is the chest CT in the same person, and we can again see these patches, predominantly consolidation, but not confluent consolidation, patchy areas of airspace opacity. Using the D-ALPO framework, this was an acute process. It's multifocal or patchy. It's in a peribronchovascular distribution, which means it's up against the airways and the vessels. There is a little bit of adenopathy that we see in the mediastin. And this ends up being a case of bacterial pneumonia. Confluent is different than patchy in that it involves a greater proportion of the lung in a contiguous way. I've shown you a graphical representation of large confluent airspace opacities, and I've given you an example in a patient. And you can see these airspace opacities are big, dense regions of airspace opacity, which may be involving almost an entire lobe or an entire segment of the lung. On the chest CT, we can see large areas of consolidation. The consolidation is confluent and dense. We do see some scattered areas of ground glass opacity, but predominantly the pattern is this dense, confluent airspace filling. Now we don't know what's causing the airspace filling just based on the fact that it's confluent. So we have to start thinking about our D-ALPO approach. This was an acute process. It occurred very rapidly and sometimes can resolve rapidly as you'd see after treatment with the appropriate medications. In this case, it's central predominant. There's relative sparing of the periphery of the lung. We're calling this again confluent consolidation and we have pleural effusions. So we see these pleural effusions back here, small one on the left and a larger one on the right. And we also see that the heart is enlarged. Now, just based on the appearance of the lung tissue, this could be a bacterial pneumonia, it could be pulmonary hemorrhage, or it could be pulmonary edema. But when we add in cardiomegaly and bilateral pleural effusions, that can allow us to narrow our differential and say that this is likely severe pulmonary edema. Again, an example of confluent consolidation or confluent airspace opacities. 
nodules are another pattern that we're going to frequently encounter. Sometimes nodules are filling the air spaces and sometimes they're involving the interstitium. When we think about describing nodules, again we're going to use some consistent but simple terminology. We want to know is the nodule solid or does it have a ground glass appearance? Does the nodule show any evidence of calcification or does the nodule show any cavitation or central necrosis? And then we have micronodules which are a special case and we can describe micronodules as being central lobular or being in the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule as being tree and bud in their appearance, which means they're a central lobular nodule, but there's also an abnormality of that terminal bronchiole, or are they random nodules? So again, central lobular nodules can often be micronodules that have a solid appearance, but they can also be micronodules with a more ground glass appearance. Tree and bud nodules are central lobular nodules, typically ground glass nodules, that are associated with dilated and sometimes mucus filled terminal bronchioles. And this is an example of ground glass nodules in the left lower lobe. Random nodules are not confined to that central lobular location and will often occur along the interlobular septa and in a central lobular location and these are sometimes also called miliary nodules. We have a lot more to go on pattern especially when we talk about patterns of the interstitial lung processes but I want you to remember that once you've established your acuity and location start to think about the pattern of the process within the lung. Say, okay, this is a diffuse process. It's patchy. On CT, it looks like ground glass opacity. And that is going to start to help you narrow your differential diagnosis, especially when you then place it in the context of the clinical history you have on your patient.